Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we're going to introduce the next couple lessons actually by talking about driving forces. And driving forces are really things that cause reactions to take place. It's sort of a qualitative way of figuring out whether or not an aqueous reaction will take place or not. Um, Kembot, of course, uh, is back. He's got a new sidekick here. This, this should be interesting. So, um, now, just because you can balance an equation, which is what we talked about last time, doesn't mean that it will actually take place in the real world. Now, there's a quantitative way of figuring out whether or not reactions will take place, um, where you're looking at the uh, numeric measurement of entropy, which is disorder in a system, and enthalpy, which is the heat gain or loss, and trying to find favorable conditions for both. Um, it's Gibbs free energy. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about a real simple qualitative way of kind of determining whether uh, reactions and solution take place. And we're really looking to see what happens to the product. Um, if you were producing widgets and putting them in a closet, eventually the closet would get full of widgets and you would say, well, I guess I'm done producing widgets. Same thing sort of happens in solutions. Um, so anything that actually would remove something from the closet would cause you to continue to make things and put them in the closet. Um, so the formation of a solid, a precipitate, uh, where something falls out of the solution essentially frees up the closet. Trap door opens and the widget falls through the floor and you can keep putting stuff in the closet. Formation of water is a little weird, uh, but imagine that uh, uh, you're actually just making more closet space, uh, which is really the formation of water. And so obviously you can keep producing more and more water and it's not going to get in its own way. Production of a gas leaves the system but now up instead of down. And then the analogy sort of falls apart with transfer of electrons. But we know that usually when you're transferring electrons, you're completing uh, valence shells and making things more stable. So that would definitely be a driving force. And so keep an eye out for these, and we'll spend the next couple of lessons talking about all these in detail. But I figure, I guess we should certainly define some aqueous terms for the rest of the day. And so aqueous simply means dissolved in water. Um, and, and you can notice that with those qualifiers you put after a compound, parentheses AQ. In fact, qualifiers are really important in this unit. Uh, we need to know where these things are aqueous or precipitates or gases. Uh, that's going to help us. And one of the most important ideas in this chapter is the idea that ionic compounds, if they're aqueous, actually break up into their component ions. And this is a really key idea. We're going to use this a lot. And so if you look at sodium chloride, NaCl, uh, when, you, when a chemist sees that, uh, they're saying, oh, you know what? The sodium ions and the chlorine ions are separate. And so they're floating around separately in solution. Now, you don't have to write it that way. It takes up more space, but understand that the thing on the left equals the thing on the right. And notice that the superscripts come back, and that's one of the few times you actually see superscripts again, outside of just the initial naming of compounds. And we're going to use them a lot in what's called total and net ionic equations. So again, big idea is that aqueous ionic compounds can be rewritten as their component ions, whether they're monatomic or polyatomic. The solution is just, of course, obviously the homogeneous mixture of stuff. Dissolution, the process of dissolving. Whether something's soluble and insoluble is really uh, how much of it can dissolve in a given solvent. And that sounds sort of um, subjective, uh, but there are objective ways of, of determining whether or not something's soluble or insoluble, or even partially soluble, which we'll talk about again in a, in a later lesson. Kembot's got some wise words of wisdom there. Ha! <laughs> yeah, fun about those guys. And so the solute's the thing that's uh, being dissolved versus solvent that's doing the dissolving. Electrolyte's a neat little term. Um, you, you've obviously heard of electrolytes through sports drinks and things like that. An electrolyte is simply something that produces an ion in solution. Um, so if you sat there on the street corner with a, with a pitcher of salt water, you could say, hey, here's my, my uh, drink with electrolytes. Uh, that's all it is, something that breaks up an ions. Um, you, you could have a, a, a pitcher of sulfuric acid and say that's chock full of electrolytes uh, because it's simply ions. Now, there's certain ions your body needs, um, uh, but uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can do the research on things like Gatorade yourself and see what sort of sports drinks have to offer in terms of replenishing electrolytes that your body uh, loses through physical activity. Um, now, electrolytes can be defined as weak or strong, and, and there's an unfortunate connotation with the terms weak or strong. Uh, but it just simply refers to how much of it dissociates or breaks up. And so a weak electrolyte doesn't break up much. You don't get that many separate ions while a strong one does. Um, and that's an intensive property. And it's outside the realm of concentration, which would be an extensive property. And so you can certainly have a lot 
of a, or a high concentration of a weak electrolyte. Or you might have a very dilute strong electrolyte. So again, the two are very separate terms. Um, concentration and whether or not something's a strong or weak electrolyte. And we'll see this a lot with acids and bases too. Um, a lot of acids are defined as weak or strong. Again, weak simply refers to how much uh, hydrogen ions get dumped out into solution, not necessarily the danger of it. Hydrofluoric acid, for instance, made famous by uh, Breaking Bad, um, is actually a weak acid, but as you can see, it, you know, it has some interesting effects. Uh, precipitate is just the insoluble product that, that falls out of solution. Ah, oh, fun, bo fun bottom. Gonna enjoy having you around. And so we can look at several solutions here, or pure substances as the first one may be, and look for conductivity, look for electrolytes. Now distilled water um, doesn't have any electrolytes in it, so it shouldn't conduct. Now water does auto-ionize to a very small degree, um, but um, you're not really gonna see much conductivity in distilled water. Tap water, on the other hand, stuff, stuff out of your tap is gonna have ions in it, hence you'll have conductivity there. Salt water, obviously even more so, you're dumping a bunch of of ions in there. But sugar water or any covalent compound shouldn't have any conductivity because it's not producing ions. And again, the ions are needed for the circuit to be completed. Electrons aren't riding across the ions like little boats. A lot of people think that happens, but based on the flow of electrons um, from ions to electrolytes, you, you essentially get a completed circuit. And so acetic acid and sulfuric acid are both uh, producing ions, specifically H plus and some kind of anion. Um, acetate or sulfate, uh, but the difference between the two is that acetic acid is considered a weak acid, which means it doesn't dissociate much, and sulfuric acid is considered a strong acid. Uh, that's why actually sulfuric acid is preferred for electrolysis of water. Putting a little like, sulfuric acid in your water allows the electricity to conduct uh, or to flow across the solution um, and allows uh, electrolysis to take place. Um, but it doesn't produce any annoying si side products like chlorine gas. So you'll get hydrogen and oxygen if you use a little bit of sulfuric acid in your electrolysis. So anyway, so looking forward to seeing these two together next time. What, 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 you, what? That, that was not, that was not expected. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the lesson for today. Uh, just introducing the idea of driving forces. Each one of these will be covered in much more detail in future lessons. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something and have a great day.